One of the things I love about the conversation that we're going to have today with Kate Torgerson, who is the founder and CEO of Milk Store, is that literally she had the idea for a company and she, she'll share her story, but the, the pain <laughs> of the situation of traveling with all the realities of what your body feels like when you're nursing. One of the things that's fascinating about what Kate's been able to create is that she really has this whole business that's directed directly to consumers, people who want to nurse and they connect with her and they enter into the service, that these women then went and informed their employers and said, this is really a benefit that I need. If you want me to travel for work, you need to help me ship this milk home. You need to figure out how to accommodate the fact that I'm away from my children. I'm happy to do my job. I'm happy to work. I'll continue to lead and manage and do whatever else, else you ask me to do. But I love that idea of employees educating their employers about how to come up with new policies. Funny, and I look at it as a uh, physician from such a different point of view that now women have a choice to be a little bit more discreet about nursing so that they feel that their employers won't look at them like maybe they are having a limitation after childbirth. So it's a win-win. Welcome to the Business of the V. Hello, friends and colleagues. I'm Dr. Alyssa Dweck. And I'm Rachel braun -Sherl. Each week, we bring you the most fascinating investors, inventors, entrepreneurs, academics, and healthcare practitioners who are making things happen in women's sexual and reproductive health. If you are a woman, know a woman, have a business or care about your V health and wellness, fasten your seatbelts and listen in to another informative and inspiring episode. We are so excited to have today's guest, Kate Torgerson, who's firstly a mom and a founder and CEO of Milk Stork, which is an amazing company that focuses on shipping breast milk. Welcome, Kate. Hi, thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. <laughs> really fun. So your story is so interesting. Even if you didn't start a company, the ages of your children and starting a company at the same time seems pretty crazy. Share with us the background, and it seems fitting where you're doing the interview from because it really ties. How, it says how much your life and your business are tied together. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the interview from the playroom. This is all, this is also kind of our office next to the Peloton, and by some Legos to my left. So, um, yeah, I have an older child who's ten, and then I have twins who are seven. And I started Milk Stork when the twins were about. Uh, seven or eight months old and my oldest was three so it, it was a wild ride back then just having twins and the toddler is hard enough. Right, exactly was there a eureka moment when you said I know what I need I know what other women need yeah it, so the the kind of the context for this all happening was that I with my first child, I had breastfed him for 15 months. And I always tell people it was rainbows and unicorns. We had a great latch, uh, never had milk supply issues. And I totally went into twins overconfident that I could, <laughs> that I would just slay breastfeeding uh, twins, but it was really hard. Um, tandem nursing is incredibly difficult. And then we had one had a bad latch, one had a good latch. They weren't necessarily hungry at the same time. Um, we had weight gain issues, just like it was a rough road. So by the time, um, and I was, when I went back to work, I was faced with a four day business trip. So those moms who have twins produce twice as much milk. And so I was producing a half gallon of milk every, uh, half gallon of milk every day. So a gallon of milk every two days. And that's where the first kind of pain point <laughs> came into literally. play. <laughs> literally. Um, because, you know, obviously breastfeeding is a supply and demand relationship. So you produce what your babies need um, in, the, in the perfect world. And so creating extra milk is not an easy feat. And it's especially not an easy feat when you're doing it by the gallon. <laughs> so um, I added pumping sessions to my schedule before the trip uh, to make a 
a stash for my husband to have while I was gone. And then I had to pump every three hours, including the middle of the night pump while I was away. And then just manage two gallons of breast milk in a hotel mini fridge, not to mention lugging it around at a conference all day. So it was just a logistics headache, <laughs> more than a headache, uh, to say nothing of bringing it through TSA, uh, which really is kind of when the rubber hit the road <laughs> um, in terms of the idea, because it is just a frustrating. It, I think every woman with breast milk feels like they're the first woman to go through TSA with breast milk. It's like, how is this not, how is this not optimized yet? Um, I got asked why I had so much milk, why one woman would have so much milk. I had melting ice. I had uh, to dump out the liquid. Uh, it was just humiliating and frustrating. And so I got on the plane pretty angry and I came back the next day and I was like, I, I, I just want to solve this. So did you quit your job immediately or did you spend some no. time building this? <laughs> so, that was a layup. Um, I knew the answer. <laughs> Yeah, and, and uh, what was your original job? Because I'm guessing it had nothing to do with breastfeeding or breast milk. Or cold chain logistics. No, I was um, an executive communications manager at Cliff Bar. So uh, I was working at a place that would have been really accommodating if I didn't want to take the trip. But I think that that's also kind of the slippery slope as you start opting out of things. Um, and I really did want to take the trip. It was important to me and I needed to figure out a way to do it. Um, so no, I did not quit. I mean, Cliff Bar was a great place to work and I did not quit right away. Um, so I was working full time, three kids under three. Uh, and I was working on Milk Stork at night after, you know, if they went to bed. <laughs> at that point, sleep was not solid <laughs> for anybody. Um, and I just would, it was my side hustle for a good three years before I actually left Cliff Bar. What were some of the early conversations you had or early research you did? You had obviously experienced the entire worst consumer journey for, for a breastfeeding mom. Did you do research? Did you spend the time on figuring out about cold chain supply? Where were your efforts in those early years? So in the early years, you know, and I tell this to moms who are, you know, starting their own businesses all the time, focus on the things that interest you. If you're sitting down and trying to write a business plan at 1 a.m., well, you know, like when you have a moment of time, it, you're just setting yourself up uh, for some hard times. For me, I knew I needed to keep the momentum going. So I really, no, I didn't do research. I, I knew enough moms going through TSA um, in my world that it was a pain point that, you know, every mom has like a travel with breast milk story if they're breastfeeding, like some, you know, crazy place that they pumped or crazy place or way that they stored their milk. It's like, everyone's got these uh, war stories. So I knew that the demand was there. Um, but it, it, yeah, it, it, I focused on the mom experience and what it would look like and how could we make that experience fantastic? Um, and how were we going to allow her to order this? Like we had to create kind of a new logistics order process because it's kind of a funky, Usually you order a sweater or something, you don't like it, you return it. <laughs> I'm so interested to hear the actual logistics um, of, of how you get the integrity of women's breast milk to remain the same throughout the, uh, the assembly line, if you will. You know, um, I, I did obstetrics for about 25 years. So I watched breast pumps come into play when they were never available. So now women really can, you know, make as much milk and store as much milk as they need. And like you said, when you have twins, you've now gone from, you know, man on man to a zone, you know, you really uh, have like a whole nother, a whole nother ball game going on. Um, but I think the um, advent of the pumps, especially the electronic pumps really made this uh, so much easier, especially for moms of multiples. How do you manage the integrity going from breast to refrigerator to shipping to et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, it's up to the mom for everything before it lands in the cooler. Um, and I think that's that's one pain point we all have is the ice packs or what, you know whatever you're using to keep your milk cold. So from what we use is we have these really nifty coolers, they're medical grade coolers. Um, so they keep the temperature consistent. They have a very high uh, 
uh, performance rating. So it's a great, it, for refrigerated milk, is it's an awesome solution. And we focus on refrigerated milk because it's so hard to get a freezer in a hotel room. Most moms are dealing with, maybe they get a refrigerator. Um, mm -hmm. If you wanna freeze it, it usually means like, I have to go down to the concierge and ask if there's a employee freezer that I can free, you know, like getting access to a freezer is already difficult. So we focused on refrigerated. Now, you know, fast forward five years later, we do have a frozen non-dry ice solution. Um, and a lot of moms are using frozen right now because of COVID um, and frozen moves through airports a lot easier um, with not as rigorous of an a, um, inspection process. So did you need to do any um, studies or FDA types of clearances to ensure that antibodies were staying put in breast milk, that uh, there were no contaminants, anything along that line? So what's great about our solution is that mom's packing up her own milk. So she's, you know, safeguarding the process on her own. Um, but the studies, the, the uh, coolers, again, they're, they're medical grade coolers. We don't actually make the coolers. So we, we vetted our, our partners very rigorously. Um, and the only time, you know, the other thing is that these coolers perform for 72 hours. So there's, there's a good, um, they, get, they, they get overnight at home and there's still time on the clock um, when it's sent priority overnight. When you started the business or, or even where it is now, did you start with direct to consumer and then shift to a more employer-based model? And, and what was the decision around changing the business model? We actually never changed the, the business model. Um, so we went, I went directly to moms because I knew that they were the ones that had the pain point. And to be honest, in the early days, I thought it would be really, it's already hard to explain pumping to an employer. And so many women were already, that I knew were already pumping in like closets and empty conference rooms or if they were lucky. So I felt like explaining breast milk shipping was gonna be really hard to explain to HR. But what ended up happening was that moms started using Milk Stork for their trips and then rightfully asking their employers to reimburse them. Um, and that is what generated an enterprise channel for us. So um, moms were really the ones explaining the, the business case. You know, if you want me to hit this quota, you want me to go to this conference, then, you know, it's not just a hotel I need. I need you to actually ship food back for my kid. Um, and they made the case for us internally. And that's what generated the enterprise demand. And right now, in terms of individual moms versus employees through um, companies, is what is the breakdown in terms of your revenue? Is that something you can share? It's still, it's a 50-50 breakdown. We still have a lot of moms who use us for personal travel um, if they're going away from their family, or um, they might still be purchasing on retail and having it reimbursed if they're you know, a smaller company or the, the only breastfeeding mom at a company. Yeah. One of the things that strikes me is breastfeeding just as a topic comes with a lot of judgment, whether you do it, whether you don't do it, how long you do it. And what's interesting to me when I look at all your materials and I've heard you speak and have had the pleasure of meeting you before, there's absolutely no judgment. You're able to talk about a space that's ripe with judgment and not communicate any sense of that. Was that intentional? How are you able to do that? And I'm sure you've been in these conversations where people say, oh, you only breastfed for 15 months. Oh, my God, you breastfed for 15 months. You know, so it could go either way. Yeah, I mean, I think what it comes down to is just giving women a decision. And I think the decision to wean is a personal decision. Um, you know, if you're doing that at three months or six months or one year. But I think what my goal was, was to set up logistics that enabled women to make that decision instead of kind of like having pumping sessions drop off or taking a business trip and having your supply go down and then not being able to get it back. I feel like so many women unintentionally weaned um, because they went back to work and it's just a tough um, pumping. It works hard. And here's today's hot flash. I find it fascinating that women will produce as much milk as they need for their baby's needs. And that's why women with multiples or women with one very voracious eater will make enough milk to accommodate for what their baby's needs are. I also wanted to make mention of how many benefits are afforded by women who are nursing. 
immunity, and of course, immunity is all the rage these days. Antibodies are, you know, uh, produced and in breast milk and afford babies protection. They also have talk about uh, flavors and smells being in breast milk based on women's diets before they nurse and those uh, offspring being less finicky eaters in future. Who knew? Do you keep data as to whether or not women are breastfeeding longer? I know it's not a business metric, but it might be, it's interesting. I mean, only anecdotally, I get so many um, notes through LinkedIn or through Instagram that where moms are like, I'm so happy I was able to breastfeed longer um, because I had this, especially for people who are in sales um, or consultants where they're really road warriors. Um, those folks really face a tough pumping journey. Um, and I, I, also they're very type A personalities. So I'm sure they're gunning for the 12 month recommendation and, and really need an easy way to, to try to get to that goal. Alyssa, I'm curious how many patients would come in, you know, then and now, and I want to also understand Kate's interaction with her OB, but what, before Milk Stork, what did you have to offer your patients in terms of support of doing nursing and traveling or nursing and staying home, whatever it is, just the whole issue about how to decide whether they should or shouldn't nurse? Yeah, the whole bottom line is that once that six week postpartum visit comes around and goes, we're out of the loop. We really are not as obstetricians still involved with whether people are nursing or not. We definitely get them started. We definitely advocate for it. The American Academy of Pediatricians and OBGYNs recommends nursing for the multiple health benefits that are afforded both to mom and to baby. Uh, but once that six week postpartum visit comes around, it's really up to the pediatrician to uh, have that kind of conversation with mom. I will say that what I have seen in practice is that you and this kind of company have allowed for a little bit more discretion so that the uh, embarrassment or, uh, you know, obviousness of somebody having to take a break to, you know, nurse is kind of out of it now and it could be done on, on, on their own time. So I think that actually information is going to be a little bit harder to come by because women can do this on their own without having to, uh, to do it in public or in such a public facing way. There is a lot of controversy. I remember contributing to an article about, you know, uh, formula shaming uh, that the New York Times put out because women who did not nurse or who did not nurse for an extended period were kind of shamed. And I want to just make a, 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 an overall statement that it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody for years on years. I mean, have some women who have nursed their kids until their teeth were causing all kinds of trauma to the nipples and other women who really say, you know what? I, I can't do this after three months, I'm done uh, for various reasons and that's okay too. So there's really two sides of the coin. Um, what I loved on your website um, is all the verticals that you've done, you know, all the uh, extra, uh, blogs and uh, informational pieces and other products that you're offering for women who are nursing because I think the story that I hear in my office is I'm kind of tired of advertising to the universe that I'm lactating because my my bras aren't holding in the uh, you know <laughs> until I hear a baby a baby cry I start to yeah, lactate yeah. or you know my shirt is not the right material for this or uh, you know th things of that nature. I get a lot of patients in my office who have uh, delivered and are well past that six month postpartum time who are having difficulty with intimacy and sexual relations because of pain, because they are nursing and their estrogen levels have not returned to normal. So I was thrilled to see that you address that uh, on your site with products that might be uh, helpful. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about, you know, some of these uh, side, uh, side things on the website? So really it came about because we see so much innovation in this ecosystem and a around femtech. And there was an opportunity to bring those solutions to milk stork moms who I would say are kind of uniquely pained moms in the world of breastfeeding because they're kind of operating on the extreme of pumping and going places. Um, and also the other reason was that all of my kids are IVF kids. So I've been on that journey. <laughs> I've been on that roller coaster before. And um, I think helping aspiring parents become parents, helping um, 
and God, having gone through twins and a three-year-old that first year was dark times and really hard. <laughs> it's a, so finding solutions to make things just easier, just make it easier for moms, like especially in the first year, we all just need to celebrate them and make set them up for success. One of the things that you both said is you refer to is how many different parts of your life being a mom or, or breastfeeding affects you. You talked about it affects your work life. It, it affects your intimate life. It affects your energy. It affects your sleep. So one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is this hopefully continuing narrative that you can't talk about a woman in pieces <laughs> yeah. because all of her pieces fit together and she has reactions and all those pieces. And I don't know that people would necessarily connect breastfeeding with mental health or the anxiety of business travel. And you figured out because you lived through it, that there really is a lot happening. It's not just the logistics, but it's the logistics plus a whole number of other things. Well, I, and I think one thing that people pumping come uh, when, when a woman is pumping, I mean, the investment that she is putting into that milk is her time. It's uh, time away from her job. It's love. Um, it's, I mean, she, if, if for the moms that do make it 12 months, I mean, think of how many pumping sessions it takes just to get there. Yeah. It's a marathon. Um, Not to so, mention the physical labor of of yeah, pumping. Up to, I mean, hooking up to a you pump know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a physical, uh, a physical activity essentially. And it dehydrates you, you know, women need to take in extra calories for this. They need to hydrate more than, uh, usual. Uh, so it takes a physical toll as and well. And it's demoral, it's a demoralizing experience to do it in a bathroom hooked up to a medical device. You know, I mean, it's not, a, a it's not an experience where you're like, yes, that it's not like nursing where you have this, kind of bubble and warm fuzzies hooking yourself up to a pump in a bathroom stall in an airport is a horrible experience yeah. um and yeah so i think when when i talk about pumping too i'm like let's understand the investment that that mom is making and let's meet her at that investment her time yeah. and her love is valuable um and we need to just understand that Said exactly I, like a business person and a absolutely. mom. I love that. I mean, Although I want to say, I think we're making so much progress. So I recently had the pleasure of finally traveling and being in an airport and yep. I'm vaccinated. I'll, I'll just nice. let you know that. Um, but I, I noticed that there was an actual little kiosk that had two doors on it for pumping, nursing, lactation. It was a lactation kiosk. And it was the first time I really saw this. So yeah, the mama uh, of pods, they're called the mama of pods. They're amazing. And uh, they are, in, I mean, airports have been, they're in airports across the country and it's, it's awesome. Yeah. So one of the things that lends itself to what you're doing now, now you've expanded into other products, it seems that partnership would either be in development or, you know. Oh, with mama of that well, with with places where you can easily breastfeed, with with pump with companies that make breast pumps, with companies that make carriers for babies, for bra manufacturers, are those the kinds of things that you think about down the road? Yeah, I think we, there's definitely a sense of like, how can we all work together? Rising tides raise all boats. Like, how can we help sure. normalize breastfeeding? Because um, one thing we haven't talked about right now is that there's also this whole objectification that goes with breastfeeding. Um, it's, you know, people are not used to interacting with women's bodies in the way that breastfeeding um, is, you know, actual feeding of a child. And so uh, taking the shame and taboo away from breastfeeding and just really empowering moms um, wherever they are to have a choice about breastfeeding and, and not to feel like they're doing something that society doesn't support. What's coming down the pipe for Milk Stork? Um, so we kind of have now put together a group of services that we're providing to um, our enterprise clients, which is really exciting. We call it the flock and it's really to take care of moms, right, you know, conception through that first year. We have virtual lactation support, um, making sure that companies, when people return to work are outfitted with hospital grade pumps. I know for me, a hospital grade pump was hugely important in my pumping journey. Um, it just ensures that you're faster, more milk. Um, and it means you're not lugging stuff around because that is a big, you know, showing up to work with your pump and realizing you don't have 
a pump part is a horrible <laughs> way to start your day. Yeah. But um, it also seems like it's a good return on investment for a company to buy one of those pumps because you'll be, be able to get back to whatever your responsibilities are much more quickly. Much faster. Yeah. And I think moms will feel more success. They'll feel more successful when their milk supply isn't dropping. So I, I, if companies can provide hospital grade pumps, it's huge. Um, and then we also have um, support around childcare right now um, a, a, with through Femtech partners. Childcare is a huge issue, um, especially during COVID. Uh, but it's always been an issue. It's Absolutely, just now, it's always been a pro it's always been a challenge, yeah. and now it's just more visible. What advice would you have for people who have a great advice, a great company? I mean, your, your story is great. And I know that every minute wasn't, you know, a breeze and that everything wasn't going uphill at a, a breakneck pace all the time. But now that you are where you are and you've gone through the bumps and you've put together the system and you've created essentially a category, when you look back, can you provide some insight to people who might be listening who say, either my company's not going like that, or I don't know how I would do that. You know, I think of you have three kids under three, you could do anything. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not, or do nothing. Um, you know, I think I really, uh, I spent a lot of time at Cliff Bar, as I mentioned before, I was there for 18 years, actually, before I started um, Milk Stork. And one thing that I really took away from my experience there is that it was run by someone who was truly adventurous and entrepreneurial. Yeah. And I embraced it from the beginning as an adventure. I actually didn't even the first, as I was in the TSA line, I wasn't really even thinking about like a company. I was just thinking about like, how are we going to solve this? Because this is terrible. Um, but through it all, I mean, there were so many times where I was like, God, I don't know how we're going to get over this hurdle or around this obstacle or um and you just keep going. It's kind of like motherhood. I mean, how many times have, <laughs> have you experienced it as a mother? And it's been like, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to get this kid to sleep? How am I going to get this kid to go potty in a potty? Because you have to. <laughs> I'm curious, what's your thought about and have you given any um, thought in your business to, uh, you know, st milk that's not necessarily from you know, your own breasts. So in gen uh, pooled milk or, uh, you know, communal milk. milk. surrogacies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, one area that we're, we've kind of moved into recently is supporting uh, families that use surrogates. A lot of the surrogates are providing milk after birth. Um, yeah. And so we have set up a, a service that enables the surrogates. And it, it's a huge for the surrogate. I mean, once you've uh, once you're pumping and mailing this stuff, it's, it's a big pain point for the surrogate who's mm -hmm. really doing this out of the beauty and goodness of their heart. Um, sure. So to make that process easier for them um, and for the family to receive that milk. So we have a nice little service around that. Um, and then in terms of milk, milk surrogacy between community members, um, we don't actually have any, it's unregulated. Uh, it's mostly happening on a community basis between women. So that's not actually an area that we've um, delved into. And I want to go back to something you said before, we've all had those moments, but you know, both the twins are crying, your three-year-old is awakened, you're working on this business, or let's even say it was a year into it. What do you do personally to sort of refuel your tank? when that happens, because we hear <laughs> so many times from entrepreneurs that you get to a point where you just need refueling and you are doing everything and you're juggling as fast as you can while you're running on the treadmill, literally the treadmill <laughs> of your life. What do you do when you get to that point? Because as the leader of this company and the spirit of the company that you've created, they, people look to you to set an example and to to be, to not be in control, but to be able to wade, wade through those difficult times. It's interesting because in the early days, there was a lot of adrenaline and momentum <laughs> and I was totally sleep deprived. I mean, like I was not sleeping at all. So I was kind of in this, <laughs> this crazy, um, uh, fr frantic kind of existence. Um, so I think having that, and I was so excited by the idea. It wasn't operationally complicated yet. Like at that point we were building and building was fun and exciting and it's the beginning of an adventure. Um, I think refilling the tank became very clear to me this year um, when I was homeschooling two kindergartners and a fourth grader <laughs> and running a business. 
and you know my husband's working from home and it became very clear to me it wasn't in the early days of the pandemic but when the kids went back to school in September and we learned that they were gonna still be doing distance learning um, that I was in this constantly trying to predict what's happening next kind of phase where I'm like what's when's COVID gonna end when's distance learning gonna end how how what predicting what's gonna happen and at a certain point I realized that I can't predict all these things <laughs> and I have so little control over so a big portion of what was going on and it just taught me to be mindful and just to be in the present so when I feel like I'm slipping out of that yeah. I go outside and I literally like watch the wind blow in the trees and I like let raindrops fall on my face and just try to get present in the moment instead of trying to predict everything that's going to happen in the next six months. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> great. That's great. I thought you were just going to say you eat a cliff bar and you go right back. To everything, <laughs> well, it's funny because at the beginning of COVID, I would, every time I got one of those emails, which turned out to be a joke or a post, you know, I've lost 30 pounds. I've eliminated <laughs> sugar. I'm running marathons and I'm doing 20 hours of yoga. Like that didn't help me feel present. <laughs> no. So I like to set the bar a little bit lower, like have a raindrop <laughs> fall on your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Watch the leaves blow in the wind. Yeah. Just like this is just be human and, and present in the moment. Is there part of your story that we didn't ask that you want to make sure you share? No, I would just say, you know, for moms that have that idea, I really just think find the kind of find the wave that's, that you can ride <laughs> that's going to you know, excite you and then worry about the more complicated business model and market research and all that. And one thing I always tell people is in the early days, I actually had business cards made and I, it was a uh, founder and CEO of Milk Stork and I carried them around. It just was a reminder of the path that I was moving towards. Um, even if it wasn't going to be immediate, you know, it was, I knew that it was going to be eventual. Yeah. If you can see it, you can be it, they say. Yeah, yeah it was a right. visualization. Well, thank you so much for being our guest today, Kate. Your story is amazing. You're amazing. The company's amazing. And we look forward to following your success in the years to come. So keep it going. Thank you so much. Don't forget. Subscribe to our podcast at businessofthev.com for the latest trends and trendsetters in women's health and business.